I'm starting a little early here. Let people get into the room. We got a lot to cover tonight. If someone could let me know in the the group chat if you can hear me okay, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Hannah. Give people a few more minutes to get into the into the room. It's eight oh one. We'll start roughly around eight oh five.
give people about one more minute before we start. That's great, Jim. I'm glad you can hear me. All right, it's 805. Let's go ahead and get started. So, as we left off uh, on Saturday, we talked a little bit about bacteria and viruses. I mentioned to you all in class today um, that most of this unit will be really focusing on the immune system and how bacteria and viruses um, impact our immune system. So as far as the questions asking about retroviruses and knowing the lytic cycle, epigenic cycle, um, I would, I would be able to, you know, identify, like, look at it, look at one of those cycles and be able to tell me what's going on. But as in terms of memorizi memorizing them, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, basically, we'd be interpreting a diagram. would probably be the most likely question we'd ask you about the lysogenic or lytic cycle or even a retrovirus. Um, in terms of bacterial structures, like I see people talking about the pili capsules and so forth, um, all those, again, not going to be found on this final exam. Again, we're going to be focusing on the immune system. So I'm going to be talking about that first, and then we'll move on to talk about um, the other units that we didn't get to on Saturday. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I'll switch over to my Prezi presentation. And we'll get started here. So, the immune system. I have to fast forward to, through all of this to get to the immune system. Here we go, finally. All right, so the immune system. So let's start with the basic overview. Um, so basically, if you look at our immune system, we have two major parts. We have the innate immune system, and we have the adaptive immunity. Um, think about the innate immunity as always on standby, always waiting, um, always around, kind of doing its job. So we, that, that's broken down into two major parts. You have the barriers, you have skin, mucous membranes, and then the secretions by your skin, such as uh, sweat, for example. You have then your internal defenses. You have phagocytic cells, cells that eat bacteria and viruses. Then we talked a little bit about natural kill cells. And then antimicrobial, antimicrobial proteins we really, really didn't talk about, um, and your inflammatory response. Basically, um, the innate immune system found in animals um, recognizes that there are um, something wrong, something that's not supposed to be there and it attacks it kind of all in the same way. There's no specificity to how the innate immune system works. Um, because it's not specific, it's, all, it's, it's very quick, it's very rapid. So it's our first line of defense. So any kind of pathogen, which would be a bacteria, fungus, or a virus that gets into our body or we come in contact with will first be dealt with with the innate immune system. After that, your adaptive immunity would then take over. If it does get past those defenses, then you have your humoral and your cell-mediated responses. They're, um, they recognize traits that are specific to that particular pathogen, uh, and then we that requires a vast array of receptors and so forth. Uh, but because it's specific, 
it is a much slower response because your body has to learn and communicate to other cells what this pathogen looks like. Um, but because it is um, specific, it's usually stronger um, and does a very good job of um, preventing bacterial infection. So um, the interesting thing about the immune system is animals are the only organisms with this major immune system. Um, and vertebrates, such as us, um, possess this adaptive immune response. That's nothing, really, nothing really talked about in class, but that is something that's pretty interesting. So starting with the innate. So we have the external membranes, or sorry, the external features of our immune system that block pathogens and the internal parts of the innate immune system that um, gobbles up or destroys pathogens. So we'll first talk about the skin. Um, the skin prevents, you know, it pre pre uh, prevents pathogens from getting in. It's a waterproof barrier to infection. You have sweat glands that make the surface of the skin inhospitable to many microorganisms. It's not a nice place to live. Um, though you do have commensalistic bacteria living on your skin, um, they just occupy space that pathogens might otherwise occupy. So you actually have bacteria living there um, just to kind of take up the parking spots that other bacteria would want to inhabit if they had room. So that's one reason why using too much antibacterial products like soaps and cleansers and so forth are not always a good idea. Um, then you also have mucus, um, that disgusting and sticky stuff. Um, it's sticky for a reason. It lines all of the openings uh, to your body. So you think of your throat, your ears, your nose, and so forth, um, that are all, all lined by mucus. Um, that way you, you prevent pathogens from getting in those openings. Um, prevents a, it provides a sticky situation where if a bacteria or virus would basically stick to that mucus. Um, it also contains lysozymes, um, which will disrupt bacterial cell walls. So if it does get stuck in the mucus layer, um, it'll basically, you know, be destroyed. Then you have your internal defenses. We didn't talk about all of these internal defenses. Um, we did talk about um, phagocytes, which are, you know, your macrophages. Um, collectively, they're called phagocytes, that they're just cells that eat other um, cells. Um, so we're not really going to go over all of them, but basically these cells are roaming your, your body, just looking for things that don't belong, and um, basically gobbling them up. Um, they use your circulatory system and your lymphatic system as their major highways, um, and they just digest material that, that they don't recognize. Um, they use The reason why they're called phagocytes is because they use phagocytosis, something we learned first semester, um, as their way of consuming foreign material. Um, and what's interesting about these phagocytic cells is that they then present that material to the specific immune system um, to launch that more specific response to teach the immune system what this organism or what this pathogen looks like. And then we also talked about the inflammatory response where uh, basically this is a, a, a twofold um, prong of attack where um, whenever the skin is ruptured your or your body is infected, you have increased blood flow and increased heat. Um, the blood flow to the area brings more cells to the area and the, the heat of the, of the, of the inflammatory response um, basically gets those cells working faster. Um, so you get the cells to the site of infection uh, where they will release signals and recruit other cells to the site of infection, basically just increasing blood flow to the area um, to help with fighting off the pathogen. Um, again, that will happen no matter what kind of um, infection it is and what kind of skin rupture there is. Even the tiny little, little splinter will invoke the inflammatory response, which is why it's red and swollen in the area of the um, where the skin was ruptured. So that is your non-specific or your innate immune system. Again, always on the ready, always ready to fight any kind of pathogen that you may encounter, both block it and fight it. Um, and then you have your adaptive immunity, the, the specific response. So we'll start with the humoral side. The humoral side basically has the B cells which result in the production of antibodies. And antibodies are specific to the particular molecule on that particular pathogen. Um, those spots on the pathogen that they are particular to, we call those antigens. So anything your body sees as foreign would have these surface proteins, these markers that we call antigens and antibodies attached to those antigens. Um, and those antibodies are produced by the B cells. So basically phagocytes will present the antigens to a helper T cell. The helper T cell kind of learns what it looks like. 
activates, talks to the B cells, and the B cells start to differentiate into two different populations. You have the pal plasma cells that will make and secrete antibodies that will flood the circulatory system, and then you make those memory cells. We'll talk about their importance a little bit later, but they remain in the circulatory system. They remain viable, which means they remain available um, just in case a future infection of that same pathogen presents itself. So you get both kinds of cells made, but that only comes with the communication from the helper T cells. Um, and then you have your cell-mediated immune response, and this is done by the T cells. Um, this results in the activation of particular T cells that recognize specific antigens, those same antigens on the bacteria or virus that's infecting you. Um, and then this, again, is all coordinated by the helper T cells that has learned what the pathogen looks like. Um, and then it talks to the T cells as well. And these T cells differentiate into two populations, cytotoxic T cells, which will find cells that are express the pathogen or the antigen, and trigger the death of those cells. Again, they punch little holes in the cells, causing those cells to die, especially in viral infections that stops the virus from being replicated. Um, you also then have the memory cells, just like in the B cells, that remain viable and circulate through the healthy lymphatic system um, in the case of future exposure to that same antigen. So to go all the way down to the way the cytotoxic T cells work, they basically are roaming your body looking for cells that are infected. And once it recognizes an infected cell, it basically releases this chemical that puts tiny little holes in that cell membrane. Um, and that cell is going to then die because of that. I'm not going to make you memorize the chemical names, but it's kind of an interesting name. It's called perforin, which if you think of perforate, it pokes little holes in those cells. So together with the, the B cells and the T cells, you have your adaptive immune response. So these are the major players in the adaptive immune response, you have your mature B cells that produce antibodies and your mature T cells that roam around and kill infected cells. Um, so you definitely need to know the difference between these kinds of cells and what part of the immune system they work in. Um, this is a great diagram to, to look at. Um, I gave you a similar one during um, our unit. Uh, where you have the antigen exposure, it's either engulfed by a antigen presenting cell or recognized by a B cell, which communicates to the T cells. T cells communicate to B cells and T cells to start proliferating, or proliferating, I'm sorry. Um, also telling them to make memory T cells, um, but these B cells and T cells go and do their thing depending on um, what kind of infection it is. But the, the, be the most important part of this is the, the central role of the helper T cell, and that is we talked about HIV, the most devastating effect of HIV is that it wipes out these helper T cells and makes them not do their job very well, if at all, which basically wipes out both sides of your um, specific immune system. Um, I did want to, and I'm going to zoom in, oops. on the um, use of, scroll in here, how our body creates immunity through our um, primary and secondary responses. Um, the primary response, again, is that first initial response um, to the infection, which creates a, a low level of antibodies produced and then a, a secondary response is much higher and much, much more robust. Um, and then we have learned as a, um, in the medical field that we can basically trigger this primary response um, by using things such as vaccinations. And a vaccination basically prepares your body for the infection by producing those memory cells. Those memory cells remain in your body for a second exposure. That same antigen, which happens to be the first exposure in reality to your body, but your body produces a massive amount of antibodies and clears the infection. All right, I'm going to go over and check on the uh, questions. Over here. I'm going to switch over to the Google slide deck. So 
this question, uh, does the innate immunity combat viruses as well as bacteria? Yes. Um, you know, it's not going to kill a virus because the virus obviously isn't alive. It's not going to disrupt the virus. Um, but it basically, it can trap the virus. The mucous membranes can trap it. The, the skin cells um, can prevent the infection from happening. So your innate immune system does block viruses, block viruses, blocks bacteria, even blocks fungi um, from entering your body. Even protus will be blocked by the innate immune system. Well, we need to know the different kinds of bacteria, chemotrophic, chemotrophic. Um, I would be familiar with the terminology. Um, basically, if you know what the word chemo, auto, hetero, um, and photo mean, you should be able to figure out what kind of bacteria those are. Um, is the innate immunity adaptive? No, it's not. It doesn't adapt at all. That's it's just it's part of everybody's immune system. There's no learning process to it. It just attacks regardless of what it is, which makes it very quick, but it doesn't adapt because you don't um, learn from the first exposure. It's only the um, the specific immune response, the cell-mediated and humoral immune response that is adaptive because you get those memory cells produced. And those memory cells allow for a secondary um, response, which is much more robust and, again, gives you your immunity to that pathogen. Great question. Well, we have to know what things like micro, it's macrophages, not microphages, and stuff will be in the adaptive innate immune response. Yes, you should know what a macrophage is um, and the other players in the adaptive immune response. Well, we have to memorize the entire sequence of things happening in the immune system. Um, I guess answering that question, I would say, I guess, kind of, yes. You should know what all parts of the immune system do. You should know what the humoral part does, the cell-mediated part does. You should know what your innate system protects against versus your adaptive immune system. So um, I'm not sure what you mean by... Um, the sequence of things happening because there really is no sequence. The humoral and innate immune system, kind of they all work at the same time. Um, but I wouldn't say memorize the steps, but more of what each role of the immune system is. Um, this question, do we have to know vocab terms like capsid, viral envelope, bacteriophages, uh, capillaries, lysogenic cycle, lytic retroviral, difference in bacteria, primary and secondary immune response. Some of those, yes, but the things that deal with the viruses and the bacteria, um, no. Um, but you should know primary and secondary immune response and how those play into your adaptive immune system. Is the immune system steps the same for both bacteria and viruses? Um, not really, but that's something we didn't get into too much detail on, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so I would say don't worry about that kind of detail for the final. All right, any other questions on the immune system before we move on? What are the parts of the humoral and adaptive responses? Well, the adaptive responses includes the humoral and the cell-mediated responses. The humoral response is the response of B cells producing antibodies that are specific to the pathogen. The cell-mediated response is the production of cytotoxic T cells that go around and um, destroy infected body cells. Both of them will act at the same time. Both of them do produce memory cells to provide a um, stronger attack if you are exposed to that same pathogen a second time. So Unit 6 is mostly about the immune system and how it defeats pathogens and viruses. Yes, not really about viruses, structure, and function. Yes, the focus is mainly on the immune system. Now, will we ask you questions maybe about a diagram of a virus or a diagram 
of bacteria or maybe data from the lab that we did, we, will, we could ask you that as well. Like I said, there's going to be no bacteria questions and no virus questions, but stressing yourself out and memorizing all the details about them isn't going to be worth your time because, again, the major focus is the, um, the major focus is on how the immune system attacks them. What do I mean about the biology of bacteria in the study guide? Um, that was just a general heading of, you know, just general in characteristics of bacteria, like they are prokaryotic um, organisms, they're unicellular, the basic stuff, basically, what that's what that question meant, or that statement meant. Okay, we're going to move on to plants. And let me switch over. this presents correctly all right so plant anatomy and physiology or form and function I think I retitled it for this year so basically what you need to know about plants well first you know why plants have adapted to life on land they have to where they get the energy from they get it from the Sun um, and they have adaptations that help them best absorb light as plants have evolved they've evolved ways of absorbing light better, which are their leaves. Um, they've also evolved to um, have gas exchange and, and you know, use the gases of needed for cell respiration and carbon dioxide for photosynthesis um, and get those gases into their tissues. And they've also adapted to um, transport water and limit water loss because they know plants, once they moved out of the water, they no longer had a constant water supply. They had to find ways to limit water loss speed up water absorption, um, get the minerals that comes with water, and then transport that water to the photosynthetic parts of the plant, which are the leaves. In terms of tissues that you need to know, I would say the most important tissues that we've covered was definitely the vascular tissue and the meristematic tissue. So vascular tissue being tissue for transport, meristem tissue where growth occurs. Um, we did talk a little bit about dermal tissue, which is just the outer protective covering, and then the ground tissue has so many various functions. Um, I didn't really talk about it in detail. I kind of just point out the important parts you need to know, and I'll talk about those when we get to those um, plant organs. Another major characteristic about plants is the fact, are they vascular or non-vascular? You have vascular plants that have xylem and phloem, and they are what transport water and sugars, which allow these type of plants to grow much larger than the non-vascular plants. There's always going to be an evolutionary connection to a lot of the things that we talked about in terms of the plant unit. Um, so non-vascular plants lack that vascular tissue, which is why they are smaller and not there's not that many of them. You look at this diagram. Let me skip over to it here. Um, sorry that it's so blurry. Um, but basically, if you look at all the different plants that there are, there are four main groups of plants. Flowering seed plants being the most dominant plant on the planet, they make up over 200,000 species where there are barely any um, mosses. Um, which is interesting, there's barely any cone-bearing plants too because of the, basically the warm um, temperatures that many of these flowering plants live in outcompete these cone-bearing plants. Uh, but we didn't really talk too much about that, so I wouldn't really worry about that kind of information. But just talk, but generally knowing the basic uh, kind of evolutionary trends we find in plants is important. We also talked a lot about the reproductive nature of plants and how plants have a diploid and a haploid stage in their life cycle, which is very different than animals. That was like one of the major differences that we touched upon in terms of plants. Um, you have your spore plants and your seed plants. Um, spore plants release spores as their dispersal mechanism. They release spores into the air, and those spores land on the ground. Um, and if they land in a favorable environment, they will grow into a new plant. Um, spores, though, are unicellular. They're haploid cells, so they'll grow into the haploid version of that plant, which happens to be the gametophyte. Um, the unfortunate thing about spores is that if they don't land somewhere hospitable, they're not going to grow, and that's not great for the plant. Um, seed plants, on the other hand, release seeds as their dispersal mechanism. Seeds are multicellular. Um, they have an embryo enclosed, so the plant has already started to grow. That sporophyte plant has already started growing inside the seed, and it has a protective covering along with a food source for that growing embryo. And seeds can remain dormant for long periods of time, which allows them to land in maybe an unfavorable spot, wait, and then grow when conditions are better. 
Um, we didn't focus on this too much in my class. We focused more on just flowers um, and not cones. But basically, um, flowering plants have this extra advantage to them where they have flowers that develop into fruits around the seeds that help animals disperse those seeds, whereas gymnosperms don't have those fruits. In fact, gymnosperms means naked seeds. Um, they rely solely on wind for dispersal. Both flowering plants and gymnosperms do produce pollen, which is the male gametophyte, which is, I think, one of the biggest um, advantages to life on land is because these type of plants, these seed plants, no longer need water for reproduction. The sperm does not have to swim to the egg because the sperm is transferred via the male gametophyte, the pollen grain. So there's our simple diagram of the alternation of generations of plants where you have a sporophyte generation which gives rise to a gametophyte generation which gives rise back to a sporophyte generation. So knowing this general concept will be important for the final exam. Okay, other adaptations to life on land. You have, uh, first, you have roots. Uh, the root structure and function. Basically, roots are for absorbing water and minerals from the soil. So plants have part of their body structures living below ground um, where they need to absorb water and get minerals and so forth from that soil. So the root hairs basically help increase surface area for water absorption. We did then talk about the apical meristem, which is where the root grows, and then you have the um, protective um, root cap, which protects that meristem as that root grows through the soil. You don't want to damage the growing region of the root. And then you have that vascular cylinder or that vascular tissue which transports water up the root and transports sugars down to the root. Again, roots need the phloem cells because they can't photosynthesize. They rely on the leaves to send sugar down to them. There are other tissues that we could have talked about. We just didn't. Those are the major ones to know about the roots. In terms of leaf structure, um, we had the cuticle, which is a layer of protective cells in the top and the bottom of the leaves. We always talked about the, the leaf like kind of like a sandwich. So they're the bread. Um, you have then the palisade layer, the middle layer of photosynthetic cells, which, which is really focused or concentrated near the top layer where most of the photosynthesis takes place. You then also have the spongy layer right below that. It has a lot of air spaces in it. That spongy layer allows for gas and water to be exchanged with the palisade layer that is using that water and carbon dioxide gas for photosynthesis. Um, you then have the stomata, or the stomates, which are basically openings. They're not cells. They're the openings on the underside of leaves. And there's some, some plants that have them on the top of leaves as well, but mostly concentrate on the underside of leaves because that's where it's shadier and less uh, water will be lost. Um, though that water loss is important. We'll talk about that later. And you have guard cells that open and close the stomata to help regulate plants in their um, need for um, water. Plants will close their guard cells if there's um, a lack of water, if they're in like a drought or it's very hot out, um, to prevent too much water from being lost because they can wait on photosynthesis because they can store sugars and use that as energy. But they really can't go out and find more water. Light is always going to be there. Water won't. So a plant will close its stomata if it's low on water to prevent dehydration. And then we talked a lot about the flower um, being a major plant reproductive part. In terms of um, labeling the flower, you all did very well on that. It's probably not going to show up on the final exam. In fact, I don't see the point of doing this type of question because um, you all did very well on it. So I'm sorry to, to bum you out if you've been studying that, but don't worry about labeling a flower. Um, it's just not going to be in the final. What you do need to know is the advantage of pollination and the difference between pollination and fertilization. Um, we kind of already talked about the advantage of pollination, that the pollen grain is transferred to the female part of the flower. Instead of having the sperm cells swim, it's transferred via uh, insects, birds, mammals, all kinds of other things can transfer pollen. That pollen grain germinates and grows a pollen tube down into the ovary where an egg is waiting. Um, that pollen grain contains two sperm cells in flowering plants. The first sperm cell fertilizes the egg, which results in the embryo. And then the second sperm cell fertilizes the two polar nuclei in the um, ovary or in the ovule, which results in the endosperm. And the importance of that endosperm, again, is its nutrition for that growing, developing embryo so it can germinate underground and grow into a new plant before it can photosynthesize. So it's important to know the functions of double fertilization and why it's such an important advantage to flowering plants.
So again, there's a general life cycle of a flowering plant. Um, again, the importance is that idea of double fertilization. All right, and then we got into plant transportation. How do we move um, needed materials around a plant? So just a general overview. Uh, regardless of size, plants have very similar transport requirements. They have to get oxygen and carbon dioxide um, to the leaves for both photosynthesis in terms of carbon dioxide and for cell respiration um, with the use of oxygen. This is typically done just with diffusion. Um, this works in opposition at the leaf and the roots. Um, so at the leaf, usually oxygen is given off. Um, and then at the roots, oxygen is taken in. And it's the reverse for CO2. CO2 is taken in through the leaves and given off by the roots. Um, to photosynthesize, water also must move in the roots of the plants through the stem and up to the leaves with the transport water. Um, so plant physiology is fundamentally dependent upon the movement of water in the plant at the roots and out the plant at the leaves. So we're always trying to move water up. Um, up the plant. That's kind of the most important thing. We pull that water up. Um, we're not going to get into solute concentration, all that big detail. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get into um, the flow of sugar through the flow. So transpiration. Transpiration is the continual movement of water into the roots of the plant um, um, and then up to the leaves. So just the, the diffusion of water into the roots is not enough pressure to move water through the entire plant. So there has to be something pulling um, against that pull of gravity. So gravity is, begins pulling down on the water, and so something has to be pulling it against that pull of gravity. Um, so because plants are really tall, the current leading theory to how this works is the transpiration theory. Um, it's the movement of water from the roots to the leaves up into the atmosphere, um, which is a major part of the water cycle. So how does transpiration happen? Basically, it starts in the leaf, where water moves from the xylem to that, that, that spongy layer of the leaf where it can be used for photosynthesis. Excess water moves to the atmosphere via the stomates in the leaf, and this pulls water up the xylem. The cohesive attraction between water molecules keeps water moving through the stomate. So because we're constantly pulling water out of the stomata, that transpirational pull is what gets water up the plant. In the stem, okay, water is not being used for photosynthesis in most cases, but we're still pulling at that water molecule through the process of cohesion. Um, the xylem cells are filled with water, and those water molecules are attracted to each other through the, the hydrogen bonding that water exhibits, um, and that kind of keeps water all stuck together. We also have the adhesive property of water, where water sticks to the xylem cell walls, which doesn't really help Keep them, help them move up, but it basically prevents them from moving back down. There might be a little bit of what's called capillary reaction where they kind of pull up a little bit. You may have seen this if you've ever um, drinking out of a straw before or, or try to fill a glass of water all the way up. You see that little meniscus at the top. Um, that, that, that attraction to the side of the glass kind of pulls the water up a little bit, but mostly it prevents water from falling back down, especially when the plants close their stomates to prevent water loss, we don't want all that water falling back down the xylem. And then we didn't really talk too much about the roots, but basically the roots will be hypertonic to their um, to their environment, which keeps water moving into the plant. So the the, the inside of the roots have basically more solute, um, so that will pull water into the roots um, into the xylem. So again, uh, transpiration is made possible by the fact that water moves through the plant is always moving from an area of low water potential to kind of being pulled up. Um, we didn't really talk about the potential of water, so I'm not too worried about that, but just I want, to, I want you to, to reemphasize that concept that we're pulling water up the plant. 
So stomates are a big part of this control of pulling water up the plant. Um, the opening and closing of stomates is a major way plants are able to control transpiration and gas exchange. Obviously, if the stomate is open, water can leave, but carbon dioxide can get in. Um, if the stomates are closed, then water can't leave, but CO2 can't get in. So plants have to kind of balance, do I photosynthesize and potentially lose water, or do I close my stomates and not photosynthesize but retain water? We didn't really talk about how the guard cells open and close, so don't really worry about this. I just like the images of showing that if there are cells that regulate the opening and closing of these stomates. Um, don't really need to talk about this picture. Um, what's interesting is that night transpiration does not typically occur. Um, as water continues to enter the roots of the leaf, the positive root pressure can cause water to be pushed up out of the plant, forming droplets on the surface of the leaf. We can see this picture here. So because of lower temperatures, um, usually we don't have much transpiration, but that root pressure still can push some water up. Um, and then finally talking about the phloem. Um, in my class, we talked about this idea of source and sink, um, where phloem tissue transports sugars made in the leaves to the rest of the plant. It's not just a downward movement, um, but it is movement to where plants need um, sugar. And this is, an act, this is a, a, a use of active transport. Plants have to spend energy to, to get this process to happen. Um, so sugar is actively loaded into the phloem through a uh, basically a, a, a transport, active transport protein. Um, this creates a high concentration of sugar, which we then call the, the source. This source then attracts water, um, which then creates a high pressure, which then pushes the um, sugar down to the sink, where, the, where the, the sugar will be used. Usually the sink in some cases, and during especially in the, the summer months, would be the roots. Um, because there's low sugar there. And that is what's called bulk flow. Um, so once loaded in the phloem, the highest sugar concentration of leaf causes water to diffuse into the phloem. This leads to high pressure or positive pressure, which moves xylem sap through the plant until it reaches an area of low sugar concentration in which then the sap diffuses out of the phloem, basically where the plant needs that sugar. All right, so that is it on plants. Let's take a look at the questions and see what people are asking. All right, um, this question, should we know all the functions of the tissues or just what they are? Like, should we know that the dermal is the outer layer or more detail? I would know, especially the dermal layer and the ground tissue, since the ground tissue has a lot of different functions. For example, um, the palisade layer of a leaf is considered the ground tissue. The sponge layer is considered the ground tissue. The, there are storage layers. I mean, there's all different kinds of ground tissues. So I like to call the ground tissue kind of miscellaneous. It does everything else that the dermal and the vascular tissue doesn't do. Um, again, the focus on is the vascular tissue and the, um, the meristematic tissue where plant growth occurs. All right. I did talk about evolution in the last review session, so I'm not going to talk about it in this one. But I will let you know, don't worry about Darwin, Hutton, and Lyle. Could you explain the sporophyte and gametophyte generations in greater detail? Okay, so the sporophyte generation, you have to remember, is named that way because it produces a spores. And this is where the meiosis occurs. So the sporophyte generation is diploid, however, it creates haploid spores. Haploid spores are made through meiosis. So there are special parts of the plant that go through meiosis to create haploid spores. Once those spores are released in some plants, like mosses, they will land on the ground and grow into gametophytes. In other plants, like flowering plants, the spore, flight, the spore is not released, but it turns into the, the male and female gametophytes within the flower or the cone. But basically, the gametophyte generation produces the sperm and the eggs, produces the gametes. And then those gametes have to fertilize each other. The egg has to be fertilized by a sperm to produce an embryo, which will grow into a new sporophyte plant. I would not worry about the the reproductive cycles in detail 
Just know the major differences between them all, but more importantly, know the evolutionary advantages of flowering plants compared to ferns and compared to gymnosperms and compared to mosses. So knowing the reasons why they are different is more important than just knowing the differences themselves. Do we need to know the sink stuff? Um, I would not worry about the vocabulary term, but I would understand the need for movement of sugar and understand that it's a form of active transport, so it requires energy, and that it involves um, the flow. What molecules are in the spongy layer? Um, the spongy layer is going to be filled with air spaces that are usually filled up with water and the combination of gases, carbon dioxide, and the oxygen that is being produced by the photosynthetic process. Will we have to know the general life cycle of a flowering plant? I don't quite know what you mean by general life cycle, but I would definitely under, you know, know um, w that pollen is produced and that that has to be transferred to the female part of the flower, which then is going to be used for fer double fertilization. Um, and then uh, I would say that's pretty much the detail I would recommend you focus on. I would not worry about the parts of the pollen grain themselves. I would just remember that they carry two sperm cells for fertilization to take place. Um, the apical meristem and the root cap, cap in greater detail. Basically, apical meristem is where mitosis occurs. That's where cell division takes place. That's how the root grows. It grows from the very tip of the root, and then the cells elongate behind it. And the root cap's basic function is to protect that apical meristem because if you damage the cells that are going through mitosis, then the root can't grow. So the root cap, cap is basically there for protection. It's like a protective helmet for the apical meristem. Do Abomgars and Wolf have the same final? I don't know about Wolf with an E, but Wolf without an E will be given the same final as Mr. Bomgars does. Those of you Mr. Baumgart's class, that was a joke. There is no Mr. Wolf with an E at Vernon Hills. What is passive transport? You should know that from first semester. How dare you ask that question? No, I'm just kidding. Passive transport requires no energy for movement, so osmosis, the way water gets into the xylem, is a form of passive transport. Function of dermal tissue, it's protective. Just like your skin protects your, you, you, like in your immune system, look at that, connection. And um, in plants, it protects them from outside forces like water loss from the, the tissues and from bacteria and viruses. Yes, bacteria and viruses can infect plants. Oh, primary and secondary growth. I'm glad that question came up. I didn't even realize till just now that's not in the actual prezi. Um, so primary growth, again, plants want to grow taller first. They get towards the light and they get deeper into the soil. Secondary growth, plants grow outward from their lateral meristems and produce xylem layers. Every year of growth produces a xylem layer towards the interior and produces a phloem layer towards the exterior, which eventually those phloem layers don't accumulate. They get sloughed off. But that's how you can tell the age of a tree, by counting the number of xylem layers, the rings of that tree, because every year the plants will produce new xylem and new phloem as part of their secondary growth. So they grow taller first and then grow wider second, which is why it's called primary and secondary growth. Great question. Do we have to know the four main plant groups? I would know of them. Um, the haploid and diploid stages of the plant life cycles. I would know that the sporophyte is the diploid stage and the gametophyte is the haploid stage. And all the vocab of a plant, stigma, ovule, etc., etc. Um, in terms of all the vocab, I would say don't worry about the structures of the flower so much. Um, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't say know them in detail, be, be able to know what they are. Um, but yes, all this vocabulary term I would recommend you do know, to put it simply. Or at least be able to apply it. What is the sugar sink? The sugar sink is where the sugar needs to go. Um, it's, for example, in the summer, the sink is the roots. The roots don't have sugar, they can't photosynthesize, so plants send the sugar down to the roots. In the summer, 
or sorry, in the spring when new root when new leaves are being made, the roots have stored all that sugar. So the roots become the source, and the sink is where the sugar is going to be pushed to, which is going to be the new flower buds that occur during the spring. So again, the sugar sink is where ever the sugar is needed at that point in time of the plant's life. I am not going to really explain bulk flow in a more precise manner because you don't need to know it in a more precise manner. Just know that there's a source of sugar where photosynthesis is taking place or the sugar is being stored. That would be the source. And then the sink is where the sugar is going for growth or for storage, depending, on, again, on the plant's needs at that time. It's different in the fall, summer, and spring. Um, nothing really happens in the winter because the, the um, plant is dormant. So, again, in the in the summer, let's take that example, the source will be the leaves, the sink will be down in the roots. And so the flow of sugar will go from leaves to roots for storage. Leaves fall off in the fall, sugar has been stored in the roots. During the spring when new growth occurs, the roots become the source to produce new leaves that need sugar for growth, and so we send the sugar back up. The source becomes the roots, the sink becomes the new growing leaves. So it all depends on where the plant needs sugar and for what purpose. I know Mr. Bongres and I talked about this, so using that vocabulary term sink, don't stress out about that. We have included both um, terms. Uh, we kind of describe what a sink is in on the final, so don't worry about knowing what the sink necessarily is. As long as you understand it's where sugar needs to go, you're good. Um, do you know that transpiration does not occur at night? Well, it appears that you do know that, so I guess you do know it, so don't worry about it. Um, but no, that's not going to be like a question on the final. So is the top of the leaf epidermis or the cuticle? Yes, it's both. The cuticle is produced by the epidermis layer. The cuticle is a waxy covering produced by the epidermis. And Chris, since when did you grow a beard? Is the gametophyte the main phase of a non-vascular plant like a fern or moss? And then the sporophyte is the main one of a vascular plant such as angiosperms. Close. Gametophyte is the main stage of life only for mosses. Everything else, ferns and above, it's sporophyte. And the sporophyte gets bigger as you go from ferns to gymnosperms and angiosperms. And the gametophyte gets smaller, in fact, so small, it becomes a pollen grain in your seed-producing plants. Does transpiration take place in the leaves and stoma? It takes place at the stoma of the leaves. Will we have to know the osmosis and solute stuff? No, not for this part of the final. What does the filament do? The filament holds up the anther. To remember my friend Arthur and his brother Phil. Difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Are you kidding me? That was a first semester topic. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, eukaryotes do. That's the main difference you need to know. Uh, can the sink change? Yes, depending on where the plant needs the sugar. What are the plant groups? You have the mosses which are bryophytes, you have the ferns, and you have the gymnosperms, which are cone-bearing plants, and then you have the angiosperms, which are flowering plants. Those are the four main plant groups. Major parts of a seed. Uh, seed coat would be the outer protective covering. You have then the endosperm, which is the nutritional part, and then you have the embryo, which is the part that it would be the new growing plant. That's the parts I would know about the seed. Can you explain the vascular cambium? Sure. The vascular cambium is the, the part of secondary growth that produces new xylem and new phloem. That's the, the, that's the, that's the Mary stem that produces the, the secondary growth of a plant, and it pushes outward. So as the growth occurs, the vascular cambium moves outward with that growth um, because it's producing xylem towards the interior and phloem to the exterior. Thank you for the correction. I hope you know that I was truly kidding. Happens all the time.
Uh, retroviral replication, don't worry about that. What are guard cells and what do they control and how do they control it? Guard cells basically control the opening and closing of the stomata to prevent or allow water to move out of the leaf and CO2 to move into the leaf. Plants would close the stomata using the guard cells if they were in a situation where they couldn't afford to lose water. How much detail do you know about cotyledons? Um, all you need to know is that it's a nutritional source for the embryo. That's all I'd worry about. Structures and functions of root stems and leaves. Uh, roots absorb water, anchor the plant. Stems connect the roots to the, the leaves. Leaves are photosynthetic and produce the sugars. What is flagellated sperm? It's a sperm cell that has a flagella and needs to swim through the water to get to the egg. This is found in mosses and ferns, um, which rely on water for fertilization, which is why you don't find them in very dry environments. Um, that's why that's one of the major evolutionary advantages of flowering plants and seed producing plants like gymnosperms and angiosperms is that they produce pollen that got rid of the need for water for fertilization to take place because pollen can be carried by wind or other animals um, very easily. Wow, lots of questions on plants. What is the role of pollen in pollination? Is it really important? Well, pollination wouldn't happen if there was no pollen. So yes, it is really important. But if you're asking if it's really important for the final, I would say it's mildly important. Pollination is a very important um, advantage for seed-producing plants. So I'd know definitely that evolutionary tie to it. In terms of the details of how pollination occur and how the pollen grain is formed, I would not worry about that. That is a lot of detail that you're not going to be responsible for knowing. All right, so I'm scrolling through the questions here. I don't really see any new ones popping up. So I think I've answered them all. All right, so I am going to switch back over to our Prezi and talk about our last unit, which is going to be on ecology. All right, so ecology, the independent relationships in ecosystems. So we basically broke it down into two main parts, community interactions and populations. So when we study ecology, we can study ecology at various levels. So knowing a basic definition of these levels is kind of important. Um, though we didn't really stress biomes and ecosystems that much, I would definitely know that a community is a, all the populations in a certain area. So it's all the organisms found in that area, not just one species, um, and then how they interact with each other. So some big questions. How are communities structured? And how these interactions of species and communities led to um, these properties? So first we'll talk about competition. That's probably the biggest aspect of community ecology is competition. So uh, we talked about the, the idea of a niche or niche, depending on who you're talking to. All of the organisms' interactions in its environment is a good way of thinking about it. We made an uh, analogy to an organism's job, um, where it's kind of where it fits in its ecosystem uh, or in its community. Um, so competition, competition limits an organism's actual niche, so we call that the realized niche where fundamentally it could exist in lots of different places but again competition might limit that so a fundamental niche is the maximum possible niche and the realized niche is the actual niche you find it look at these examples of these two different particles um, they demonstrate the difference between fundamental and real niche really well 
I don't pronounce these names correctly very well, so I'll just talk about them as the blue and the brown barnacles. So the blue barnacles grow faster uh, than the brown barnacles do. So since the brown barnacles can be found all over this, um, this tide, um, without the blue barnacles there, they'd grow everywhere. But when those blue barnacles are, are present, they since grow faster. The brown barnacles have to live in the upper region because they are outcompeted. And so their realized niche is that that section, the upper section, whereas their fundamental niche would be the whole um, tide zone. Um, other effects of competition, you have what's called competitive exclusion. Basically, this is, I think, the easiest one to understand. When two species have overlapping niches, one will outcompete the other. So here we have examples of two different um, paramecia. Um, they both occupy the same niche. However, they both can't exist in that same niche, so the better competitor will outcompete the other and exclude the other when grown together. Again, I think that's the easiest one to understand. Um, resource partitioning. Some organisms have evolved to coexist and basically split up the niche. Um, kind of like, it's, it's kind of a good, a good example of a realized niche. Uh, where competition drives species with overlapping niches to adapt to non-overlapping resource pools. So these different warblers will feed on different parts of the tree, even though they're, they you know, technically could feed anywhere. They have just evolved a behavior which allows them to only feed on certain areas, and that is to prevent competition with each other. And you have character displacement, how competing populations are more divergent in adaptive characteristics than non-competing populations of the same species. So these two different finches on separate islands by themselves will have very similar beak depths, which would probably mean they eat very similar food. Um, but when they're grow when they were when they were found on the same island through years of evolutionary competition, they have evolved, they have diverged away from each other. Um, through different, their characteristic of their beaks. Um, so you see character displacement, the different beak depth of these two species of finch is very different on that one island in which they coexist. Again, this is to prevent competition, to prevent overlapping niches, to allow for survival of re and use of resources. So that's another, again, a good example of um, character displacement is a great example of evolution. And you have predation, which is one species, the predator, kills and eats the other species, the prey. You probably learned that in fifth grade. Obviously, one benefits from the interaction. The other is negatively infected, uh, affected. Um, but what's interesting about predation is that it drives many evolutionary adaptations. Again, pulling back to our evolution unit. Um, you know, we have different color coloration of organisms, like, as camouflage. Um, that can or color that confuses predators. Um, you also have warning coloration of advertising a threat to predators. We talked about the coral snake being, you know, brightly colored as like, hey, don't mess with me, I'm poisonous. I'm sure you've all seen the coloration of a skunk and you stay away from those. Um, then you have mimicry, where a harmless species mimics a harmful species. I love this example. You have um, a green parrot snake, which is a snake, and then a hawthorn, sorry, the hawk moth larva, which looks a lot like a snake head. And I would steer clear, but really it's just a, like a caterpillar. Um, and then you have two or more harmful species with common predators mimic each other, like yellow jackets and cuckoo bees look very similar. Basically, they work off each other, say, hey, let's kind of work together. Not really, they don't really talk to each other, but um, this kind of evolutionary trend of stay away, we're going to sting you has been presented. And then you have herbivory, uh, which is very different than predation because um, one species, the herbivore, eats the part apart of the producer, the plant, or the algae. So it's not like they're eating all of it, they're just eating part of it. So producers have evolved many adaptations to control herbivory. Um, seem to have been missing um, the other picture. We, we talked about secondary compounds in my class, uh, but I found this awesome, interesting picture about uh, hairy pods. I know, I think it was somebody asked about why there are hairs on the uh, fast plants we are growing. I think it was Lily asked that question. Um, but that, that those hairs seem to prevent um, her, herbivory, prevent herbivores from eating not only the stems, but eating the pods as well. 
And then we had symbiotic relationships. Two or more species lived in close contact with each other. There are three major types of this. You have mutualism, which is, ah, oh, everyone wins. That's the best one. Both organisms um, are positively impacted by mutualism, which you have the acacia tree and ants. The acacia tree provides the little tiny homes for the ants, and the ants clear out the base of the acacia tree, which basically they clear out any other growing plants, which gives all the water and all the minerals to the acacia tree. Both organisms um, are benefited. And you have the clownfish and the sea anemone. The, the clownfish gets protection. The sea anemone um, gets basically cleaned by the clownfish. Um, and um, scraps of food that the clownfish drops can be eaten by the sea anemone, so they both are benefited. And you have parasitism. This is the most common type of symbiosis and the, the creepiest. Um, you have wasp and bowfly larva, um, mosquitoes and mammals, wasp and caterpillars. You want to watch that video on your own. It's really cool. Uh, then uh, someone asked this in class, I believe it was Alex, about uh, brood parasitism, where you know um, birds will lay eggs in other birds' nests and, and like have them take care of those. Um, that would be an example of parasitism because then those birds are competing, or those baby birds are competing with the other birds for um, food. And that's a negative impact. So I guess that would be an example of a parasite. And then commensalism. This one's always the hardest one to really think about or even find really good examples of because it's, it's not always true that one organism doesn't benefit in a positive or get negatively affected. Um, the African buffalo and the egret, you could say that the egret just kind of lives in the back of the buffalo. Um, the buffalo, you know, they get food and stuff from the buffalo, but the buffalo don't really get uh, a benefit from them. But then you could say, well, they are getting cleaned. Maybe those bugs are parasites, and that could be a benefit. Um, so does that really, is that really commensalism, or is that more mutualism? Um, nesting birds and trees, I guess the tree is not affected in some cases, but maybe sometimes it is negatively affected. Maybe the bird's kind of like a parasite. Again, it's a hard one to really nail down. Um, the other two are definitely out there. Commensalism is definitely the, the hardest one to really wrap your head around. So there's all the different types of interactions within a community. You have competition, predation, herbivory, symbiosis, paratism, mutualism, and commensalism. Um, we did talk about characterizing communities. We talked about diversity, a um, little bit on species richness and relative abundance, and how this both uh, all plays into biodiversity. So just knowing a basic understanding of that would be important. And then we did also talk about succession, where if a disturbance occurs and alters the community structure, removing organisms or changing resource availability, um, succession will take over. Oops, sorry. Succession would be either primary or secondary, going from pioneer organisms to climax community. But basically, based on the availability of soil, will depend on the speed at which succession takes place. Again, primary succession is on previously uninhabited land or land that has lost its soil due to glaciation or something along those lines, um, where secondary succession is on previously inhabited land, land that has soil present, allows it to be much faster. Um, and then we had population dynamics, um, where we look at a population. Um, I meant to go to this slide up here, where the population is groups of all the same. There we go. Um, it's each level of organism. Um, Members of the same species make up a population, so all human beings are one population. Um, that's looking at this level of organization. So how populations grow, we talked a little bit about growth. Um, don't worry about measuring population size. Um, but we did kind of talk about population um, distribution, where individuals tend to be distributed in three major patterns. This is usually based on resources and competition. Um, you'll find clumped organisms around, you know, resources that are necessary. So like water, for example, you'll find, you know, trees growing near rivers and, and water sources and not so much um, out where there is no, no water. Um, these starfish, these sea stars, show clumped distribution. They're growing in, they're, they're living in clusters. You will find uniform distribution where, where competition occurs. Um, these penguins are a great example of this. They all have their little territory. 
um, when they're mating, and so they are evenly spaced. And then you have random. Plants are a great example of random distribution because they don't choose where to grow in most cases. So if they land somewhere that's favorable, then they'll be randomly grouped there. So um, the thing about population distribution, um, it's all based on your frame of reference. Um, depends on how zoomed in you are to the area in which you're looking at. So, I mean, you can think about it right now. You all, students, are probably in more of a uniform um, distribution because you're all in your homes. Your homes are probably evenly spaced apart and so forth. Um, but if you look at, um, at the state of Illinois, you're up in Lake County. You're kind of clumped because Lake County has a high population, whereas compared to southern counties, they're not as high populated. Um, so again, it all depends on your frame of reference when you look at distribution patterns. All right, then we talked about how do populations grow. All populations will experience what's called exponential growth at some point. This typically occurs in small populations, though, um, as well as, as populations that are well below their carrying capacity of the environment. So there's plenty of resources for them and then they will um, grow rapidly, especially if they have a long life cycle um, and they can have an easy time of reproducing. So you get that, that rapid growth. One becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, and so forth over a, long, uh, a relatively short period of time. And then you get to your logistic growth model. You get your, 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 your flattening out of the curve. This is much more common of typical populations um, and they'll oscillate around what's called their carrying capacity. So we always like to see these nice, beautiful S-shaped curves. We you have your lag, your log, and your stationary phase, where the stationary phase shows the, the carrying capacity of a population. But those graphs don't really exist that cleanly in real life. They usually look a little more something like this, where they'll have their ups and their downs. They'll go above the carrying capacity and then come below. As long as they don't go extinct, they'll come back up and so forth. Um, and they'll fluctuate around that, that carrying capacity line. Okay, but you do definitely see uh, increase in growth range and then a staying kind of stable along a carrying capacity range. There's all kind of factors that limit that carrying capacity. Um, so what factors, how does the environment affect population growth? Um, so you have mainly, um, we talked about density dependent factors where you have competition for resources, you have predation, you have waste accumulation, territory, you know, space, um, just intrinsic factors. Um, and then disease can be density dependent. Um, and then we had all those density independent factors, which I don't have pictures of, but those are your more random natural disasters that it doesn't matter how dense the population is, the factor is going to regulate the population regardless. And that is where we're going to end, my friends, with ecology. So let me take a look here at the questions you all have. Let me switch over. All right, let's see what ecology questions you all were asking. I'll start with the... Do we need to know about how people affect the environment? Yes, I would make sure you, you know the effects humans have had on biodiversity in terms of our um, overuse of it, how we've you know been a big part, a big contributing factor to the loss of it. Um, I know Mr. Baumgart's class talked on global warming. We kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, but, yeah, you should be aware of how humans have had an impact on the environment in terms of loss of biodiversity. Difference between lag and log phase. The lag phase is the, the slow growth at the beginning, and then the log phase is the, the rapid growth, the exponential growth, and then the stationary phase comes after that. So it's lag, log, stationary in terms of our, of our, of our growth. Example of clump distribution and uniform distribution. Life, life like real, like real life examples to help put it in perspective. So, clump distribution be a good example. Would be um, you know, if you look at it, the Africa savanna, 
and you were monitoring the 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 um, large mammals. They'd all be found around watering holes. That'd be a clump distribution. Um, uniform would be. Um, It's very random, very rare to see uniform in nature. Uh, a cornfield would be a great example of uniform distribution because um, we planted them in rows. Um, usually, territory, territorial animals um, will be more uniform. So, like maybe like grizzly bears in um, Yellowstone National Park might be more uniform because they all have their own kind of space and don't come in my space because I will maul you to death or something like that. Can you describe commensalism, please? Um, Commensalism basically is one organism benefits and the other is not affected. The best example I can always think of is barnacles on a whale. The barnacles get moved from place to place, yet the barnacles don't hurt the whale and don't help the whale in any, in any way. That is probably the best example of commensalism I can think of. Um, one benefits the other, not affected at all. Do we have to know about the lag in log phase? No, you should know about the difference between the exponential growth part of population growth, and then the stationary part of growth where you hit the carrying capacity. So do we need to know commensalism? Because it seems pretty hard. Um, you don't, well, yeah, you do need to know it. And if you just know that commensalism is one benefits, the other is not affected, you should be able to apply that to a certain scenario. Can you please go over symbiosis? So again, the three kinds of symbiotic relationships. Mutualism, both organisms benefit. Pollinators and flowers, great example. Pollinators get the nutrition from the flowers, the flowers get pollinated. Parasitic, a tick and a mammal. The tick sucks the blood of the mammal, that's good for the tick, bad for the mammal. And then commensalism, I just went over that one with barnacles and whales. One benefits the other, eh, not affected. Could live with it, with it could live without it, not going to matter. Does a praying mantis eating a husband count as parasitism? Um, I would say no. That actually, um, I don't know if I'd quite call it mutualism. It's not two different species, though, so I wouldn't call, call it extra symbiotic relationship at all. Um, the interesting thing about this is that that's the, the praying mantis, the husband, provides nutrition to the female to ensure her eggs will be laid. Um, so that's the actual evolutionary reason for that. Three general patterns of population distribution. You have uh, random, which plants often exhibit because they just randomly land where they grow. Um, you have clumped, and you have uniform. I kind of just described those. How important is character displacement? It's not that important to memorize. I just would recommend you know maybe it's an example of what happens due to competition. Okay, species diversity and species richness. Um, we talked about biodiversity being the, 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 the amount of different organisms in an area. And species richness is how many different species there are, but you have species abundance or relative abundance, which how abundant are they in that area, which both contribute to how much biodiversity is in an area. So you can have a lot of different species in an area and have high species diversity, but if most of them are, there's not that many of them, you don't have high biodiversity there because the relative abundance is low. So you got to have good relative abundance and high species diversity to have high biodiversity. What does the ovule in the ovary do? The ovule develops into the seed. The ovule develops into the protective coating around the seed. The endosperm develops within it, and within that, the egg develops into the Embryo. That was a plant question, but uh, you must have just asked it after we finish with plants. Can you talk about the different layers in the trees? I'm assuming you're talking about the um, secondary growth layers. I would only focus yourself, I would not worry about like hardwood heartwood and so forth, um, sapwood and stuff like that, or focus mostly on, mostly on that there's xylem and there's phloem, and you have a vascular cambium producing them, and as you produce it, it pushes outwards, and you get different layers of xylem towards the inside, and the phloem just basically sloughs off as it's produced year after year on the outside.
is climate change included in ecology? Like, do we need to know the effects of climate change? Uh, no, you don't really need to know the effects of climate change. That's something Mr. Baumgart has covered more detail than I did, so that will not show up on the final um, in detail at all. Basically, my kids know that climate change is just a, the temperature of the earth has increased, which has caused lots of issues. Will this be an important part of the test? It seems like one of the smallest units we've covered, we've learned. Um, it, it was a very small unit. I mean, it was about the same length as the plant unit. Uh, we just never had a test on it. So, I mean, it will be equally a part of the final as the other units are. Can you cover the different types of niches? Thanks. I don't have another 10 hours to talk to you about this. So, um, basically, you just need to know, in general, what a niche is. Not that there are... There are hundred different kinds of niches and are you doing this tomorrow because this was really helpful well, I'm happy that it was helpful but unfortunately no I am NOT doing this tomorrow I've covered all the units I did have one on Saturday so you can check out my YouTube channel um, if you're not in my class ask one of your friends that are in my class or just search mr. wolf biology on YouTube um, the, the review session from Saturday is up as a video you can watch um, tonight is the last night um, for this. I understand that this is more on natural selection and evolution, but do we need to know about gradualism and adaptive radiation and stuff like that? No. Nope. You don't need to know about that. Okay, I just want to make sure I've covered all the questions that were on these slides before we go. Um, how do plants obtain nutrients from the air? Um, that's through diffusion of CO2 into the stomata. Okay, I think I talked about all this stuff on the plant unit slide. And then first question is kind of a broad question. So I think I've covered that. Don't worry about patterns of population growth in developed and developing countries. Uh, we didn't really talk about, at least my class, we didn't talk about um, human population growth. Talked about symbiosis, talked about um, I think, oh, did I talk about interspecific and intraspecific competition? Interspecific is um, between different species, and intra is between the same species. That's all I would really worry about that. And we did talk about different relationships. Do we need to know, like, specifically realized and fundamental niches? You, you should know the difference between the two what a realized niche is, and what a fundamental niche is. I did talk about that with our barnacle example. Of those barnacles, I can't pronounce their names. At least I can't pronounce them well. Any other questions? All right, so we'll call that a night. I hope you all rest up, get some sleep. Finals start on Wednesday. If you have any questions, you can ask me tomorrow in class. Um, thank you for participating. Have a great evening.